recap a little bit. So the first thing we're just going to refresh ourselves with is who the clan mothers are. So remember, uh, each nation, right? So there's the confederacy, that's all six of the nations together. There's the nations, and then to split up the nations, there's individual clans, right? And each clan has a chief and a clan mother. And the clan mothers, they were leaders of the clan, uh, and they, advise, uh, they were advised by the women's council and the men's council, and they were basically responsible for keeping the peace and keep making sure everything was according to plan. And a big thing that they were, their job was was making sure that everything was following the great law of peace. Uh, as you can see here, right, they had the responsibility of selecting uh, the next chief of their clan, right? So they actually had the criteria and they picked who they wanted to become the chief. The title of clan mother was passed down from the relatives. So all the ladies out there, if your mom was the clan chief, then you most likely, uh, sorry, not the clan chief. If your mom was the clan mother, you most likely would be the next clan mother as well. A big thing is they also ensured that all the decisions made by the Grand Council, and this is something we're going to be talking about today, right, agreed with the great law of peace. So they were there for all the Grand Council meetings and making and make sure that the Grand Council, any decisions that they made were in accordance to the great law of peace. And if you remember, the great law of peace was basically the constitution. It's the, it's the laws that the Iroquois followed and lived by. It's their code of conduct. So that's the clan mothers. The chiefs, right? They were, uh, they were picked to be teachers and spiritual guides. They were leaders. Here's all of the, uh, here's all of the criteria, kind of what they're looking for when the clan mother picked the chief. Right? There are also two different kinds of chiefs. There was war chiefs uh, who would gather warriors for fighting in times of war, and there was the pine tree chief. They usually have dealt with public affairs and had special abilities. A big thing that we need to remember is that they were not above the law. So while they were the chief, and while you, you may think they're the head of the government, they, they were applied the law the same as any other citizen. So they were not above it at all. And in fact, if they did break the law or were negligent, that means they didn't do their job, such as maybe they committed a serious crime, such as murder, they didn't attend the meetings, uh, they weren't listening and representing the people, they disobeyed the great law of peace, they're not acting on the benefit of other people in mind, the clan mother could actually remove them from their job. So that brings us now to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, what we're going to talk about is the leadership and the government of the Iroquois society. Okay, so the Council of Six Nations is alive and attends as best can to, uh, as best it can to defend the rights of the Iroquois to live under their own laws. This is a quote uh, for, uh, from the 1920s, which is a little more modern from where we're studying. But basically, what it's saying is that today and historically. Uh, the Iroquois wanted to live under their laws in whatever territory they had to follow the great law of peace. And that's what the government, their job is to do. So the Grand Council, I did not add a photo. That was very silly of me. I will add it up here. It's just, but basically what you need to know is the great law of peace established a Grand Council made up of 50 chiefs. So these 50 chiefs represented all of the nations of the Confederacy. Right? So we have six different nations. We had 50 chiefs from all, actually from only five of them, but we'll talk about that later. Right? Decisions were made on a consensus basis. Consensus, if you don't remember, means that everybody has to kind of, has to agree to it. We'll explore consensus more next class. Right? But this, yeah, consensus. Nations with large populations had more chiefs than smaller nations, but they were all equal to one another. This is an important fact. Right? So what happens is, you, uh, we'll see the stats later on, but let's say the Onondaga would have 14 chiefs present and the Mohawk would only have 9. But even though the Onondaga had 14, it doesn't mean they have more power. They just had more voices because they had more population. Okay, so it doesn't mean, because this isn't about voting, it's about consensus. So it didn't matter how many people were re represented. Only men, right, and this is kind of important, only men were members of the Grand Council. But... It was women who nominated them, all right? So while men were the only people on the ground council, it was the women who picked which men would attend, which is really good and really equalizes and balances uh, the role of men and women in this. And in fact, they could actually even take away their title if they're not acting in the interest of the people. So women actually had a ton of power in Iroquois society, specifically with the ground council. This is how the ground council made decision-making process. If I were you, 
I'd put a star in this and I would spend some time on it. Your notes, this is where you're going to have to fill in the blank. So let's go through this. First, an issue arises. Right? So basically, it could be any kind of problem. It could be wanting to move a village. It could be a war. It could be treaty disputes. It could be about resources. It could be about a lot of things. What happens first is the Mohawk and the Seneca, they discuss the issue and make a decision by consensus. So what you have first is, uh, we're going to talk about this later, but you have the Onondaga, you have the Mohawk, and you have the Seneca. Uh, Seneca. And these are what... These are like our OGs, right? These are our, our, not original, but they're called our elder, right? Our elder brothers. Or is it going to say OG? Original elder brothers. Basically, uh, they, were, they joined in the Confederacy at the start, right? And so because of that, they would first negotiate an issue. They would come together and talk about it. Once they come up with a solution... Then they pass it on to the Anida and the Cayuga, okay? And they do the exact same thing, exact same issue. So let's just think about it uh, this way. Ten of you in this class, right? You're from two different tribes, five and five. Five of you are Mohawk, five of you are Seneca. Uh, let's say I have a pro uh, there's a problem in the, in the school. Let's say we don't have uh, enough PE time, okay? You guys want more PE time for next year. Well, first... Five, ten of you are going to come together and you're going to come up with a solution. Then, the other ten, because there's twenty in the class altogether, they're going to come and they're going to talk about the same problems, but they're not talking about the first ten. Okay? And they're going to come up with a solution. If all twenty, in their different separate groups, agree on the decision, then the Onondaga, right, which is where, where they're more, these are more speakers, Right? They're going to confirm the decision, and the Mohawk people will announce it. All right? So it's like they have roles. So remember you have the Oneida, I'm going to put the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Mohawk, Mohawk, Seneca, and the Cayuga. Okay? So these two are paired off. They are the younger. Right? These two are paired off. And here we have kind of our speaker role. So these two are going to be here. These two are going to be here. They make the decision first, right? They talk about the same issue, but they talk about it second. If they agree, they agree, right? Then that's when the Onondaga will confirm it. They'll say, yep, this makes sense. And then the Mohawk, right, they get to announce it. So they basically say, this is now the law, this is what we're going to do. It's very ceremonial, and then that's how we get to action taken. But, let's say that they don't agree. I'm going to change my color here. Right, let's say they don't agree. So, first of all, the Mohawk and the Seneca talk, the, uh, the Cayuga and the Oneida talk, but they don't agree. If they have a different decision... And something can so either then they go back to the other to the chiefs, they go back to the communities, they talk to the people, and then they'll meet again, or it just restarts the process, and then the Mohawk and the Seneca will then talk about it again, right into a loop. So you so basically, I'm going to just kind of clear this off because you don't need to see this. It's pretty messy. Basically, it's like a choose your own adventure kind of thing, right? The Onondaga. All they do is they listen, they're speakers, they're keeper of the fire, right? Mohawk and Seneca, uh, they agree first, and then they Oneida agree. If there is an issue here, then it gets renegotiated. If there isn't an issue here, then it's a pass. But make sure that you know that the Mohawk announce it. All the while, the clan mothers and two other advisors are sitting behind the chief, and they're also advising them, right? They're saying, like, that does, that's not a good idea. This is what the community wants, uh, and so on and so forth. The big thing that the clan mother does is says, uh, listen, chief, that's not part of the great law of peace. you got to make sure your decision is part of the great law of peace. So here is, like, again, some of the, on, in written terms, this is what the, uh, the responsibilities would be. Right? So as we said before, we have the Onondagas. They are the fire keeper. Oh, that's a bad highlight. I really see. 
right? They are responsible. They open the council. They greet. They say, hey, this is what, welcome, first of all, everyone. This is what we're talking about today. And at the very end, or right before the end, they will also confirm the decision. Okay? You have the Mohawk and the Seneca. They are part of the Elder Brothers. They are going to debate or discuss first. As you can see, they're on the same side. Then you have the Oneida and the Cayuga over here on the younger side, and they are going to discuss it second. All right? So there's an order. It's like a pecking order. If these two people, these two groups, agree or don't agree, that talks about how it's going to proceed from there. Okay? There is the sixth, the Tuscarreras, right? And uh, they joined uh, the league after the original joining. Uh, so they joined later on, and they had no voice. They were also quite small. So they didn't actually have any representative here. But what happened is when they do have issues to be discussed, that's when the Tuscarreras are represented by the Cayugas here. Okay? So just something you know. So that, that six nation because there is a Six Nation, they're voiced by one of the younger brothers. Okay? Yeah, let's go here. So that is how the Grand Council works. Okay? One of the selections, as we saw before, though, is that when issues could be set aside until chiefs get advice from their local community. The local community, like the small villages, play an important role in kind of where the chiefs are going to vote and what they're going to talk about. And how they influence that is here. Okay? So what you have is you have a women's council and you have a men's council. They're both, they're made of women, they're made of men. They will talk about issues and they will then advise the clan mothers. They have to make their decisions on consensus at every single level. Right? So they, made, so they make a consensus here. Then they advise the clan mother. The clan mother, the hoyane, right, that's also the chief. Okay? That's the chiefs. So you have the two councils, two different gender councils. They discuss the issues in their village, uh, in their nation, and then they go and they d advise the clan mother about what to do. There has to be a consensus, right? It's not, oh, Mary doesn't want this, so we're just going to go sneakily and talk about things Mary doesn't want. No, they, did, they decide about it as a group and they move forward. The clan mother then lets the chief know. And then the chief goes to the Mohawk Council as one of the 50, and then he represents the views. It's it should be very similar to what we see in modern-day democracies. So here it is broken down in words. So the clan meeting gives, a, uh, gives everyone a chance in the clan, uh, women, men, children, elders, a chance to speak. The they will then advise uh, the clan mothers, and they will inform the clan chief of the decision uh, that the clan reached by consensus. So remember, whatever happens here has to be consensus. Um, spell this wrong. But consensus. You get the point, right? This, this has to be consensus. The clan. So the clan mother will advise the clan chief, and then he will take it to the council of chiefs, and the council of chiefs or the grand council will again agree on something based on consensus. Things they talk about, they talk about peace treaties, they talk about trade agreements, they talk about war. Sometimes we talk about even like moving a village or something. The only other thing we need to talk about today is the seventh generation rule. And essentially what this is, is it's an aspect of the great law of peace. It's what the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee people, what they think about in the future, uh, when they think about when they make their decisions. One important responsibility of the Grand Council was to consider it the seventh generation. The chiefs had to always keep in mind how the decisions they made would affect the lives of their people for seven generations. That means whatever I'm deciding now, whether it's, again, let's go back here, peace treaties, trade agreements, going to war, moving a village, all of these stuff, how is it going to affect my, my family, my clan, my tribe, my nation, my confederacy 200 years in the future? Which I think is such an interesting concept. Could you, could you imagine your decisions now... Everything you're doing impacting someone else, not only your kids, not even your kids' kids, 200 years in the future, right? So it creates this moral code. It creates this code that really shaped these people, right? It gave them 
not only perspective, but also gave them values. And so I want this a thing to think about hypothetically right now. We're in a kind of a crisis where a lot of pe a lot of stuff is happening. I don't know if you're keeping up with America. They're reopening a lot of beaches right now, even though cases of coronavirus are increasing, right? And something we want to think about is ev is everyone right now thinking about the greater good, right? So remember the greater good. I don't know if you watch a lot of Spider Man. I think it's Spider Man that talks about this, but basically it's taking care of the greater population. Is what you're doing benefiting the majority of people? Right? Or is it just for yourself? Are you living a life that's really just benefiting you? Or are you trying to impact the future generations? And it doesn't have to be you dedicate your whole life to it. But you got to think about maybe your actions beyond that. Are you recycling? Are you taking care of the planet? So that whenever they develop new technologies, new business, chemicals, this and the Iroquois, but whenever they do that, they proceed with the idea of how is this going to impact uh, people seven years down, uh, down the future? It's a cool concept. It's something definitely to think about. I've attached at the end here. This is just review for what we talked about today. A little bit of notes in case you just want to review it to get something else. All right. Have a good day, guys. I'm going to end this video as soon as I get to a position where I can press stop record. It's not working. Okay. Have a good day, guys.